Uh, this morning, uh, we are continuing on in our series in Ephesians. Uh, we're going to be finishing uh, chapter one uh, of this letter this morning. Uh, so we spent a couple of months uh, looking at the Apostle Paul's pastoral prayer for the church in Ephesus. Uh, we'll continue on into chapter two after Easter uh, in the month of April. Uh, next Sunday is, is Palm Sunday, as Andrew mentioned. Uh, Neil's going to be looking at the story of Jesus' triumphal entry, uh, the significance of that moment uh, within Mark's Gospel. Then obviously following on from that, uh, we have Easter Sunday. So it's a, a Sunday which is a favourite for all of us, hopefully. Um, we can experience and rejoice and celebrate in the gift of, of God's resurrection and what that means uh, for each one of us. Uh, and I love the sense of, of joy uh, that is carried with that occasion and the fact that we can declare with confidence uh, that he has risen. It's good news. Um, so uh, if, you, if you weren't a believer uh, and you didn't have faith in God and you weren't confident that our God or any God could work within the life uh, of a person, um, then you would probably read Ephesians chapter 1 and say that the Apostle Paul went beyond his coffee limit. Um, because here we have someone who is undeniably, undoubtedly passionate about God and, uh, and passionate about the love that he has for us. And interestingly, he is deeply passionate about all of the blessings that we receive as a result of his love for us. Paul can't help but express just how joy-filled he is as he recognises what it is that each of us has because we are in Christ. It's just so obvious from Ephesians chapter 1 that caffeine is not what is driving Paul uh, in this letter. It's the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, Paul's passion for God is in fact a gift from God himself. Uh, and Paul knew with clarity and conviction the truth of what he wrote in Romans 5 and verse 5, Paul said elsewhere, God's love has been poured, it has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And this is then the overflow of a life that experiences this kind of Holy Spirit relationship that results in, in Paul living for Christ in a whole host of different ways, including what he writes in Ephesians chapter 1. The fruit of a life in the Spirit is what Paul writes in Ephesians 1. This morning's message is titled, Believe Like Paul. Believe as Paul believed when it came to the person and work of Jesus. And Paul's belief in Christ stems from the fact that he was firmly, consistently honed in. Paul was focused on Christ at all times. That's how he came to faith. On the road to Damascus, he saw Jesus. Paul saw Jesus on, on his way to Damascus. His life was never the same again. But that's how he also continued on in the faith. It wasn't just a singular moment. There was a regular pattern of Paul fixing his eyes on Jesus. He had eyes that were firmly and faithfully focused on Christ. Where else could Paul go apart from look to him? That's what we see in Ephesians chapter 1, is it not? As you look at Ephesians 1, how can you read this chapter and come up with any other conclusion apart from the one that says that Paul is someone who is all about Jesus? He is just consumed by Christ and by his work for us. The difference that Christ has made to his life, the difference that Christ can make and is making to the Ephesians' lives, he is all about Jesus often all of the time. So this is what we're thinking about this morning. We're thinking about what it looks like uh, to believe like Paul, to believe like Paul. And to believe like Paul is to fix our eyes on Jesus. To fix our eyes on Jesus is to have minds, is to have hearts, is to have wills, is to have lives that are in Christ, through Christ and for Christ. The writer to the Hebrews which may or may not have been the Apostle Paul, hand grenade. Uh, he tells us in Hebrews 12 and verses 1 to 2, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, 
the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's one thing to see Jesus, Denison Baptist Church. It's an entirely different thing to keep our eyes on Jesus through the totality of our lives. Yes, we can all have that moment where we see him, but do we keep our eyes on him in the midst of all the different challenges of life? I don't know if you've ever uh, seen the memes that are, that are titled, uh, you had one job. You had one job. Basically the premise is you had one job to do and you failed to do it. Um, and it's like obvious stuff that should not have resulted uh, in failure. And often based on the people who are doing the work, um, there's a connection often between the person who's doing the work and the failure that they commit. Um, my favourite is the College of Architecture and Planning, uh, which somehow managed to get the sign above the entrance. Instead, to knowledge of architecture uh, and planning, and they stuck the C on the perpendicular wall. Uh, which of all the colleges that should not get this wrong, it should be this college. Um, they had one job, and they completely failed to do it. And a much more loving in a much more encouraging, a much less harsher and less soundbitey way. Denison Baptist Church, we have one life and we have one job to be a people who fix our eyes on Jesus consistently. No matter what's going on around us, no matter how noisy it gets, uh, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how overwhelming it feels, keep looking to him. He started your faith. And praise God, he will see your faith right through to the very end for your good and for his glory. When we look to Jesus, uh, we will love Jesus. And when we love Jesus, we will obey Jesus. And when we obey him, we will experience the gift of intimacy uh, with him. Uh, the one who made us, the one who died for us, the one who rescued us, keep focus, guys. <laughs> The one who transformed us, the one who purposed us, he also wants to know us. So he made us, he died for us, he rescued us, he transformed us, he's purposed us. And in all of that, he wants to know us. What a privilege, what a joy, what a gift. Let's just stop for a moment and recognize what a life we have been given. What an incredible life we have. God has changed us, but he also wants to know us in a very intimate way. So if that is our foundation, let's just examine what is the Apostle Paul writes in our passage. Because here we have three ways that we can fix our eyes on Jesus and three implications for how this then changes our lives. As you read Ephesians chapter 1 in verses 20 to 23, uh, what you discover is someone who has clearly chosen to look to him fully and completely trust in him for all things. Paul here mentions Jesus seven times, seven times in a space of four verses, which I think you would agree is someone who is truly all about the one who loved him and died for him. He's focused on Christ. He mentions him seven times in four verses. So as we read Ephesians 1, 20, 20 to 23, I want us to ask that God by his spirit would do the same work that he did in the Apostle Paul, that as we see Paul's passion for Christ through eyes that are firmly fixed in Christ, let us also be the same. Uh, let us be open to God giving us the same passion the Apostle Paul has uh, when it comes to looking to Jesus. So the Apostle Paul writes this in our passage, Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. He says, He, as God, exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Let's pray. So Father, we, we pray that as we have just read this passage and as, as we now just take a moment to really reflect on what your word says. Help us just to be consistently focused on you. Help us to see you, Lord. And I pray that we would understand what it means to, to look to you, to focus on you, not only in this moment, but also 
throughout the entirety of our lives. In every season, Lord, help us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on you. We pray that you would bless us now. Help us. Lord, would you convict us of, of any ways we do fall short? But would you, would you also just show us grace and bring us great encouragement as we think about the, the tremendous opportunity we have to look to you and to live for you? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we fix our eyes on Jesus, uh, look towards the incredible reality, number one, that he has risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead. And let's have a look together at verse 20. The Apostle Paul says, He, that's God, exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead. And notice that what Paul is doing here, or rather notice what Paul is connecting here within this verse, to be someone whose line of sight is firmly fixed on Jesus, is to be someone who is firmly fixed on the power and the beauty of the resurrection. To be firmly fixed in Jesus is to be firmly fixed on the power and the beauty of the resurrection. Today, if you choose to fix your eyes in Jesus, it is impossible to do that, utterly impossible, without also fixing your eyes on the fact that he is not dead. He is risen. The resurrection means everything to us. It ought to mean everything to us. Without the resurrection, we would not be here today. None of us would be Christian today without the resurrection. Paul tells us as much when he writes to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, 13 to 14. He says, if there, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain and so is your faith. So we cannot take away a fixing our eyes on Jesus and the fact that he is not dead, he has risen. It is utterly impossible to do that. And alongside that, I also want us to see from this verse that Paul says that it was God who exercised this power. And he says this. And the very fact that he uses the word this demonstrates that Paul is wanting to connect what he had written before to what he's writing now. Last week we focused on how Paul spoke about the immeasurable greatness of his power. The Holy Spirit is for all of us who believe, and it is a great, great power for us. And this week we're looking at how Paul speaks of the way in which this same power has also raised Jesus from the dead. All of which is an echo of what Paul writes in Romans 8 and verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. His point, there is no difference. Something we looked at last week. There is no difference between the power that raised Jesus' body and the power that lives in every single one of us who believes. For the record, this is also the same power that's going to raise our body as well. It's the exact same source. The Spirit of God was powerfully at work in Jesus' life and death, and the Spirit of God is also powerfully at work in our life and inevitable death. It's the same Spirit, it's the same person at work in Jesus' life and death, and in our life and death. So this morning, this morning I want to probe a bit and I want to ask, in love, have you forgotten how powerful you are? Have you forgotten how powerful you are? And don't misunderstand me when I ask that question. I'm not saying this power comes from you. But I am saying that this power comes from God, who, guess what, lives within us if we believe. So when you're stuck in a rut, when you're in the midst of a problem, you don't look to yourself and say, I am powerful. When you're stuck in a rut, when you're in the midst of a problem, what do you do? You fix your eyes in Christ. And you say, he who dwells in me is powerful. What are those famous words from Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10? Can anyone remember them this morning? Do they ring true for us this morning? He says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. 
So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's a paradox. We are weak and yet we're strong, but it's not our strength. It's God's strength at work within us. I don't know about you, but this is a word that I need to hear this morning. I'm preaching to myself, first of all. This is a word that all of us need to hear. This morning, I invite you to be confident in the Lord that you are powerful and not because of you. It's never because of you, but because of Christ in you. And particularly hold on to that as we think about those seemingly impossible life moments. We all have these moments from time to time where it's just overwhelming. Life is tough. Hold on to that. There is a power source that is greater. In fact, there is a power source that is infinitely greater than any source of power that this world has to offer. When we face our difficulties, we can rest in God who gives us this power. You could have the very best that this world has to offer in terms of advice, counsel, physical resource, relational support. None of it, none of it compares to the power that God gives to us. This power is a person. This power is the Holy Spirit himself. And apart from him, you can do nothing, absolutely nothing. We have to remind ourselves of this every day because we so often forget it. We so often think, I've got this sorted, God. I can do this myself. I can work this out. I am powerful. It's all a lie, a complete lie. We need Christ. We need his power. And we need to recognize that we are weak. And he is the one who will give us strength. So the first point I want us to dwell on this morning is this. He has risen from the dead. And this helps us in our weakness. He has risen from the dead. There's another wee slide, uh, TJ or Neil. He has risen from the dead and this helps us in our weakness. Oh, there should be anyway. It's fine. <laughs> so he has risen from the dead and this helps us in our weakness. And there is no doubt in my mind that we all, from time to time, as I've said already, we find the Christian life hard. No question. We can all put our hands up and recognize, maybe even this morning, life is tough, life is difficult. Have you ever thought that the reason why God allows our lives to be hard is so that we rely on a power source, not our own? We depend upon him and not upon ourselves. It doesn't matter if it's a sin struggle, a Christian living struggle, physical suffering, mental illness, relational difficulty, circumstantial challenge, the solution is the same. Look to him, rely on his power, trust him, walk forward by faith, Know that God will fulfill this promise for you to give you his power. I don't know if you've heard of the story of a, a school uh, in the town of Itasca, Texas. Uh, just before World War II, uh, there was a fire uh, in the school and it took the lives of 263 children. And um, There wasn't a family in that town that was not impacted by this tragedy. And it was so bad that during the war, uh, the town of Itasca remained without school facilities. But when the war ended, the town, like many others, uh, began to expand. And they built uh, a new school uh, that featured what was called the finest, the finest sprinkler system in the world. Uh, tours were given of this new facility the, with the new sprinkler system. They were confident that never again would Itasca be visited by such a tragedy. But with the post-war growth, the town continued to expand. And seven years later, they extended the school. And as they added the new wing, it was discovered that the sprinkler system that they originally had, had never been connected. And Kent Hughes, speaking on this tragedy, highlighted that this is such a clear and obvious picture for us when it comes to the Christian life. Uh, he writes this, yet alas, it is a parable of what has happened in so many Christian lives. There is untold power available for every believer in Christ that so many never hook up and their lives are thus impotent and shamefully useless. So let this not be our testimony, Denison Baptist Church. Let us be connected. Let us be connected to the source of all power. Without it, we cannot glorify God. 
Let us be fully dependent. Let us be fully expectant of God working in us and through us for his plan and purpose. So all of this then leads us on to the next way the Apostle Paul uh, fixed his eyes on Jesus. He does so by dwelling on the fact that, that he is number two. So he has risen from the dead. And number two, he is seated in the heavens. He is seated in the heavens. And let's just focus on verse 20 again as a context for verse 21. Paul looks to unpack this idea in a bit more detail. We read this. He says, He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And notice that there was purpose for Jesus post-resurrection. It was not just that he resurrected and that was that, that was it finished. He was resurrected in order that he might fulfill a clear purpose to sit at the right hand of the Father in the heavens. And if that's true for Jesus, that's true for us as well. The day that our earthly bodies are resurrected into heavenly bodies, that's the day our resurrected lives will also be given a heavenly purpose. And that purpose will be all about God being glorified in us as we are satisfied in him. Jesus is seated in the heavens. And when we fix our eyes on Jesus, my invitation to you this morning is to fix your eyes on the fact that he is seated in the heavens. Alongside a fixing our eyes in the empty tomb, fix your eyes on the fact that he is seated in the heavens. And if you're unsure of all that, this is exactly what the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 12. Let me just read that, that passage again. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So one of the ways we fix our eyes in Jesus is by fixing our eyes on the fact that he is seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. This is where Jesus is. This is where we look. Because, because Jesus is seated in the heavenlies, we can have confidence that this is perhaps the most accurate and awe-inspiring picture that we have in Scripture of Christ right now. In the present tense, he is seated on the throne. When you're doing your quiet time, when you're spending time with God, you're in prayer, you're in his word. I don't know if you have a routine for that. Um, I know we can often have a routine. It doesn't always happen. We can all confess that. We, we all have a sort of plan, potentially, but it doesn't always work out. And the most important thing is that we have some kind of semblance of a plan each and every day. Uh, I normally uh, try and avoid using screens during my quiet time. Um, I'll use my phone to see what chapters I need to read, but I'll have a physical Bible with a physical journal uh, and a pen. Um, that's just me, that's just my own conviction. It helps me move away from technology, which is just so constant in my life. Uh, and I don't know about you, but what I find is when I get into my quiet time, as I just go right into it. I just go right into it to reading my Bible, right into just praying for different stuff, different things. And the danger with that is I don't even take time to contemplate who it is I'm speaking to and where he actually is. It's always a personal danger for me. I fail to consider the majesty of the one I'm meeting with. I choose routine over reverence. And I've noticed something really important, something which is in fact really dangerous. When I do that, my prayers can often feel superficial. They can often feel disconnected. They can often feel lethargic because I've forgotten who it is I'm speaking to. I'm just going through this process every single day. But imagine if I, imagine if we took time before we even contemplated praying to God before we even opened our Bibles imagine we just took some time to focus and to think about the one that we are speaking to 
And perhaps Revelation 5, 11 to 13 would be a helpful starting point for all of us as we just take a moment to contemplate who it is we're speaking to before we pray. John says this in, in Revelation 5 and verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless, thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is a lamb who is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say blessing and honour and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And imagine that before a word of prayer entered my heart and my lips, I chose to be still and I meditated on that picture. Imagine we did that in our own times with God. We meditated on Revelation chapter 5 and other passages like that. I think suddenly that heavenly picture of Jesus on the throne would inform and would fuel our prayer lives like nothing else. I'm not going to stand here this morning and say that I'm there yet. I'm, I'm definitely not. But this is what I'm moving towards. You know, I believe I need to really capture an accurate picture of Christ before I pray and before I spend time in his word. To see Jesus sitting on the throne is to see Jesus reigning over all things. And it is utterly possible when you carry that vision in your prayers to not have that impact how you pray. As you carry that vision, it will impact and influence how it is you pray. Merkel in his commentary in Ephesians says this about the significance of Jesus being seated on the throne. He says, Christ is seated which signifies lordship. The place where Jesus is sitting is not, is not some ordinary chair, but a throne, which implies that he is currently reigning as the sovereign king of the universe. Whereas the resurrection proclaims that he lives forever, his exaltation proclaims that he reigns forever. So I want to invite you as you talk to God to carry that biblical picture of where Christ is seated and I'm utterly convinced this morning it will change your prayer life. It will change your prayer life. Because you will have that vision of who he is. And you will pray in a different way. Instead of just going into all these different things you want to pray for. This long list of, of different needs. As you contemplate who he is. Suddenly it will lead to worship. Which then leads to intercession. Which leads to petition. Which leads to more praise and worship. Paul does not just describe where Jesus is seated, but he also describes how he is seated and precisely what he is sovereign over. And we find this in verse 21. He says that he is, he is, over, he is far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So Jesus has, has full and complete supremacy, not only over every earthly authority, but also over every spiritual authority authority that's world leaders the angelic realm the devil and his angels they are all subject and they will all be subject to king jesus so what a great encouragement for us this morning this ought to be a great encouragement to us this morning that he reigns that he rules over all you might face opposition from people in your life you might face opposition from the authorities, even from our own government. You might face demonic opposition. It may be a blend of all of these together or some of these together, but we can be rest assured that the battle belongs to the Lord. And to remain in Christ is to find victory in Christ over and above everything that Satan might try and throw at us. And the simple reason for that truth is that he reigns over all. We rest in the one who is authoritative over all things because he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. All of which brings us on to the second application, to the second point this morning. He is seated in the heavens. And this helps us in the midst of opposition. It helps us in the midst of our opposition. Jesus will have a last word on whatever pressures, whatever oppositions you face right now. He will have the last word because he is in sovereign control over all things, including every single detail of your life. 
every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord and every person is going to have to one day give an account before Christ of the lives that they lived, including those who oppose you. He is on the throne, Denison Baptist Church. He is on the throne. Praise God for that. It's good news. Trust him. Trust him. This brings us on to the final way in which Paul fixes his eyes on Jesus. And he does so by recognising that he is appointed head of the church. He is appointed head of the church. In verses 22 to 23, uh, Paul says, And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. And there's so much in those two verses, so much we could unpack and explain. Notice here that it is God the Father who orders the relational dynamic between Christ and the church. God the Father subjects everything under Jesus' feet and God the Father appoints Jesus as head over the church. And notice that we see that the church is his body. The church is Christ's body, which I hope you don't miss this. There's a relational bond between Christ and his church. And if I'm honest, relational bond is not a strong enough term. It's not a strong enough term for what's going on between Christ and the church. There's union. There's oneness. There's unity between Christ and his body, which is the church. The very fact that the body of Christ is the church shows the power of union that exists between the church and our saviour. We are Christ's body. We see this so clearly when Jesus met the apostle Paul, who was then Saul, and he was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus says to Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus didn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? He said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Such was a union between Christ and his church that Jesus himself could not separate himself with his body when describing the church. As Christ is in us, and as we are in Christ, we are one with him. And that is a precious truth that we, that we all need to hold on to this morning. We are one with Christ because we are his church. And don't mistake what I'm saying here. We are not God. None of us are God. But we are inextricably connected to God through his church. Just as a husband and wife are one, just as a vine and the branches are one, just as a shepherd and his sheep are one, just as a head and the body are one, Christ and his church are one. It's an incredible truth for us to hold on to. And that means something huge. Perhaps it's something you've overlooked. When you meet on a Sunday, when you meet during the week with brothers and sisters in Christ, you're meeting with Jesus. As we gather together, we are meeting with Jesus. The fellowship we have is an expression of his body. You cannot have a body without a head, and you cannot have a head without a body. So it's more than us just meeting and doing stuff. That's not what the church is. There is something theologically huge that is going on as we gather together. We are expressing the body of Christ together through our fellowship. And I want us to see this morning, if that level of union and oneness exists between Christ and his church, that should have huge impact on how we live. And in particular, this should have huge impact on how we also reach out to those who are far from Christ. Because the more and more we are united, the more and more we are united to one another and to Christ, the more and more we will become effective for mission. And two verses that I feel like we're looking at almost every week, but just so important for us as we think about mission are John 13 and 34 to 35. Jesus says, I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So that oneness, that unity between us and, and Christ and bet uh, between us as we think about who we are as a church, should allow us to be effective for mission. And this brings us on to our final application. 
for this morning. He is appointed head of a church and this should help us in our mission. If we truly get what this means, it should help us in our mission. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm always so challenged uh, when I read stories of courageous men and women who, who gave up everything for Christ and for the sake of his mission to for the gospel. And I often wonder what happened in them, what, what caused them to be so radical, so sacrificial, so passionate for Christ and for the gospel. And the more and more I study their example, the more and more I see that these people were, were so connected to God and so connected to his body that in light of eternity, they had this, this amazing security. They were, they, they were resting in Christ and resting in the connection they had within the body, within the church. But they had the security to then go out and share of the difference that Jesus has made to them in their life and to see other lives transformed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And one of these examples would be the story of Adoniram Judson, who many regard as the first ever American overseas uh, missionary. And in the 19th century, within the space of a few days, this all happened. He was saved. He met his future wife and they sensed a call to the mission field. All this happened within the space of three or four days. Um, and they sensed a call to Burma. Uh, and so connected he was to Christ. So much of what God was doing uh, in his life. This is what he wrote to his not yet future father-in-law. Um, they had agreed to marry. They had not yet married. They sensed that God was calling them to overseas mission. But before we did any of that, Judson first had to ask uh, for permission for her father's hand in marriage. And th th this, this is what he wrote uh, to him. As he carried just this great expectation of what God had done and what God was doing in his life. He wrote this. I have now to ask uh, whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this? for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God, can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise which shall resound to her saviour from heaven saved through her means from eternal woe and despair, question mark. Judson got it. Judson got it. He knew what it meant to be one with Christ, to live as Christ, to die as gain. It was to live as he lived for the glory of God. And that doesn't mean that we are all called to overseas mission and to do the things that, that he did. But it does mean that God has not called us to casual, comfortable Christianity. Jesus gave you everything. Jesus gave up everything in order that you might be saved, in order that you might become a Christian. We see that from Ephesians 1. We've spent the last two months looking at this. What is your response to that? As you read Ephesians 1, how are you going to respond are you willing to respond and worship? Are you willing to take up your cross and follow him in much the same way that Judson and his future wife did? We're going to respond and worship this morning. Let me just say, if, if you would like a prayer for, for anything that's going on in your life, anything that you feel challenged by, um, anything that you feel overwhelmed by, perhaps you need prayer uh, for healing, it may be for a situation you're in the middle of. It may be a decision you need to make. Let me just say, as a church, we are church. We are family. We are here for you. 
Uh, and one of the things we do is have fellowship after a time and we pray for one another. Um, so this morning we, we have opportunity to do that as we have tea and coffee and, and soup as well. And we're going to have a lunch after this. Um, everyone's welcome to be a part of that. Even if you're not going to be doing the outreach, you're all welcome to stay uh, for a, a soup lunch. As we do that, there is opportunity for prayer. So do speak with us if you would like prayer. This morning we're also going to uh, respond by, by coming to the table. Uh, we're going to do so because this table represents the fact that we are one with Christ. Uh, his body that was given for us, his blood that was shed for us. This table is for anyone who professes faith in Jesus. And for anyone who's not sure, anyone who's, who's perhaps still on a journey of faith, um, we would invite you to not come to the table, but to instead pray and ask that God would continue to be at work in your life and that you would be open to, to what it is God is doing. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is for you. And in the same way he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. This is more than ritual, Denison Baptist Church. We are not coming uh, and we are not doing this together after the message because we always do it. We are doing this because Christ has changed our lives. And we are now one with him. And we are one with one another through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. So see this as a significant moment in your week. As an opportunity to worship him and remember his sacrifice. Do not take this bread and cup lightly. Do so with reverence and awe. of The one who lived for you, who died for you, who saved you. And who has now purposed you for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we, we pray that you would continue to, to work in us as a church family. We, we, we want you to be at the steering wheel. We, we don't want to, to assume anything. We don't want to go ahead of you in any way. We just want to be responsive this morning. And, and we, we pray that as we respond in all these ways that we've talked about, and as we have thought and contemplated on, on the life of the Apostle Paul and his passion for you, and his sacrificial living for you, we, we pray that we would seek to imitate Paul as he sought to imitate you. Lord, help us to see who you are. Prepare our hearts for this Easter season. Lord, we ask that by your spirit you would go before us as we, as we go out onto the streets later, uh, and as we do something so simple and yet so powerful, we, we gift people with an Easter egg and invite them along. But Lord, I pray that you would guide those moments, that you would direct us, to individuals who are who are in desperate need of you and um, by your spirit lord would you work in us and would you help us to be effective missionaries i pray that you would empower us in every possible way for that moment so help us now as we respond and worship and as we continue on as as a church family to be church as we are one with you we are one with one another we fix our eyes upon you today jesus amen <laughs>